We are uh, finishing up looking at the name of God or what's in the name. Uh, Exodus 34, verse 6. When God entered, uh, comes, he says, Yahweh, Yahweh, or God, the Lord, the Lord. And he describes himself as compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, steadfast in love, faithfulness and for, uh, maintaining love, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And so we've looked at some of the verses uh, where that is repeated in Joel, Jonah, Psalms, Nehemiah are some of the places uh, that, again, Israel understood about who their God is. There are a lot of verses where individual or a couple of, the, of these will show up. Uh, if you have in concordance, you can certainly look those up. Uh, we're not going to go through each one of them. Uh, I started to do that, but <laughs> there are just so many that it's not, we're not going to be able to do that. But I do want to emphasize today forgiveness, and we'll be talking about that. Father, we're grateful for our time together, and we're thankful for your blessings. We're thankful for your son and his death and resurrection and his ascension, and that he rules over us. We're thankful that you watch over us and that you Love us. May we serve and glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, so f I chose forgiveness because uh, I think some interesting things come out of this. Uh, when we read through these texts again that you find in Nehemiah and Psalm 103 and uh, Psalm 86, which we didn't look at, but it's there. And uh, we find that there's the idea of forgiveness there, either st stated or at least referred to. But Joel and Jonah do not refer to forgiveness. Now, maybe that's because they don't refer to every one of these either. So, But, but it's kind of interesting, especially with Jonah, that he'll talk about God being ca compassionate and gracious and slow to anger, and he, won't, he relents from sending calamity. That's how he phrases it there. But he doesn't talk about forgiveness. And you have to wonder if Jonah had a little bit of a bias there about how he saw the Assyrians. And so when we look through the uh, Hebrew Scriptures, we find there, there's aspects of forgiveness. We talked about David. Uh, I've sinned against the Lord was his comment after uh, the Bathsheba situation. And God forgave him. There were consequences to that, but God forgave him. Uh, and we talked about Manasseh, King Manasseh. He, too, uh, repented in, uh, in captivity, in Assyrian captivity, and he then was brought back to the throne in Jerusalem. But forgiveness is, seems to be one of those things that are a little harder. And so we get to the New Testament, and we get to Jesus, and we see that Jesus spends more time or seems to spend time on, on forgiveness. He talks about being compassionate. We, Jesus was filled with compassion, say, the writers, or moved with compassion uh, because he saw people as sheep without a shepherd. But one of his early miracles was the uh, man that was lowered through the ceiling or through the roof to, right in front of him, and he's sitting there and everybody's watching, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. <gasps> you know, there was this terrible, big uh, sucking of air. You know, how could he say that? Only God can forgive sins. Well, you know, uh, okay, <laughs> we understand that part. But it, what would be easier, Jesus said, would it be easier to say forgiveness of sins or, or I forgive your sins or would it be easier to tell the fellow to get up and walk? Well, that's sort of a rhetorical question, at least from his perspective. But everybody would admit, well, yeah, it's easy to say it. But then he said to the man, get up and walk. And so he picked up his pallet and walked out or jumped out or ran out or whatever excitement there may be in that situation. So there's, there's that aspect of it. Uh, there's the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18. Uh, he was forgiven this great debt, and all this is sort of exaggerated. Uh, the fellow owed so much debt, he, it was... Million, in today's numbers, it would be millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, accumulated. Uh, and he owed all this debt. And, and the king said, I forgive you of that debt. 
And then he goes out and he sees a guy that owes him $100. And he says, give me my money or I'll put you in jail. How quickly we forget, right? We, we do that. We just forget what's happened to us. And so uh, he's called the unmerciful servant. And at the end, the lesson that Jesus brings is that if you do not forgive people from the heart, neither will the Lord for, uh, God forgive you. So this idea of forgiveness comes into play there. And then, of course, the famous discussion with Peter. How many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Nice guess. You know, number seven, God's number, perfect, you know. And uh, Jesus said, you know, seven times 70 or however you want to phrase it, 490. And he wasn't saying, well, at 491, you know, that's, the, that's as far as you go. The idea was you just keep forgiving. Uh, I'm sorry? Infinite. Yeah. Or uh, if, you, if a person comes to you uh, seven times in a day or five times in a day and asks for forgiveness, you forgive them. Which would, you know, be kind of, wow. <laughs> but that's sort of the idea there, uh, that uh, forgiveness. So forgiveness is a really, really hard thing uh, for people. There are, in, again, in the Hebrew Scriptures, a lot, uh, some talk about that. Micah 7, uh, and it's often expressed as, in distances, how far or how deep, uh, how far east is from the west, your sins will be forgiven, or how... Uh, deep, you know, is the ocean or sky and, you know, so far. And so great distances meant uh, to be forgiven. Uh, then, uh, so, so we see these things, and yet uh, we still have problems forgiving. And part of that is if we're in a relationship of some type with God or, uh, and maybe God doesn't have as much problem as we do, but with one another, a family relationship, and uh, a trust is broken, uh, it's difficult. You, we may forgive somebody, but it's difficult to rebuild that trust. And that takes time. And so there is this, that aspect of, of how we're doing it. Can I forgive someone, but doesn't necessarily mean I jump right back into our relationship. Those, ty- those things will take time and effort to rebuild. And I'm sure many of us have had friends who may have said something and we've been upset with them and it's taken a while to to get back into a uh, uh, the type of relationship, if at all. So those are some difficulties that we have in forgiveness. Uh, but God is certainly different in that aspect. He forgives. And again, David was very simple. I, uh, I've sinned against God, and you're forgiven. So I, you know, it didn't, didn't break the relationship, but there was still some difficulty, mostly on David's part. I think as you read the, the life of David, that's a turning point. Before that, David was very strong, always appealed to God, always looked to him for guidance. And then afterwards, that kind of went a little slower. Uh, there were, uh, you get the idea that he's really struggling with this relationship, and you get that from Psalm 51. He's having a hard time uh, forgiving himself for how he he, the whole situation he finds himself in, uh, creating me a, a clean heart, O oh Lord, uh, do not take your spirit from me, uh, in Psalm uh, 51, round verse 10. So those are some of the uh, ideas there. I, w- I was reading several, I've been reading different things, but I remember Corey Tembroom, who was a, uh, a Dutch person, she was a watchmaker. Uh, she and her family hid Jews. During World War II, uh, they were caught. Uh, she, she and her sister were sent to can- concentration camps. Uh, her sister died in, in one of them, and she was in, a, she was in the German uh, camps. Uh, there's a, just as a side note, uh, the camps, the, the concentration camps in Germany were not extermination camps. It didn't mean you didn't die there. Or you, and it didn't mean you didn't, people didn't, weren't put to death. That's not... It's just that they were not labeled as extermination camps. All those were in Poland or eastern Russia, uh, away from the people so the people couldn't see it. It's strange, I know, don't. You know, when people are doing str- strange things, they, you, know, you look at it and say, well, what's the, what's the difference? And, 
but anyway, she was there for uh, most of the war and then eventually freed by the Russians. And afterwards, uh, as she was uh, explaining her story and telling her, her story, she had written a book called The Hiding Place, and she was uh, speaking somewhere, and afterwards a, uh, a person, man came up to her and said, uh, uh, I want to thank you for what you said there. Uh, it was very important to me as a Christian. And she looked at him, and she recognized him as one of the camp guards. And she's thinking to herself, okay, I've been talking about forgiveness. Now I'm face to face with it. Now I, what do I do? I mean, I could turn around and walk away. Yeah, she or, was in Robinsbrook, which was north of Berlin. Right. Toward the Baltic. Right. So, and she, she said, you know, I forgive you. And so, uh, in contrast to, again, I mentioned the sunflower last week where Simon Weisenthal walked out of the room without saying anything. So there is a debate, uh, and I've been reading some of the uh, Holocaust uh, Jewish responses uh, to some of this and the debate as to how uh, how should we forgive or should we forgive and one of the comments that's been made is that uh, only those who have been offended can be for, can ask for forgiveness but if you're dead where's that come into play and so that presents uh, that assumes only one per individual in that a family is is, is often affected by what others do, and if a family member dies, so how do you treat the person who killed them? Uh, by, uh, you know, whether it's an accident or whatever, and how do you then work at that? So there, there are these difficulties that go with forgiveness. Uh, we see it in the in New Testament as well, in Ephesians, uh, forgive as your Father in heaven has forgiven you. So forgive one another, Ephesians uh, chapter something or other, five, end of four, beginning of five. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that we can talk about in forgiveness, uh, and I think it's an important subject. Uh, we live in a society that I think wants a lot of things, but forgiveness isn't a lot. It isn't talked about a lot. You know, we, I think people uh, are frustrated in a lot of ways, but can... It, and, you know, we have the internet. It, you know, it has its benefits. It has its back drawbacks. Uh, if you're young and you put something on the internet, and 10 years or 15 years later you're applying for a job and somebody who has a lot of savvy finds something, well, look what you said back then. You know, I was, 15, you know, I was 17. I was an idiot. You know, like, <laughs> have any of us who were teenagers do anything stupid? I mean, if you didn't, I want to talk to you because, you know, we did a lot of stupid things as teenagers, right? Let's just face it, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, some of us haven't grown up yet either. discovered how to use fire, it was a gift, but it was also dangerous. You yeah. better be careful with it. And of course, that was the idea of the international, the, the, the digital age. Right. You know, it's, it's a gift. It is. Mm -hmm. and it is profoundly a gift. Mm -hmm. I got my Bible right here. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and commentary. And more than one version. It's a gift, but it, like fire, it can be dangerous. Yeah. If, yeah, if we don't use it right. And so somebody, uh, again, somebody forget or uh, offends or hurts you, uh, your feelings are involved, and so how do we, how do we deal with that? Uh, the, uh, the young, the youthful mistake. Well, if we didn't have the digital age, most of our youthful mistakes will remain where they are, forgotten in past history, unless of course you run across somebody who just loves to talk about past history. And so since I grew up in New Jersey, I don't have to worry about that. Uh, so you won't hear any of my stories. Uh, but that's what happens in, uh, sometimes. How do you, uh, people, people bring up uh, past events. Uh, I remember, 
uh, and I was at a church, and I won't say where it was. And uh, so we left. It was, you know, disagreements and whatever. And so about 10 years later, uh, I'm, we're celebrating uh, my mother's birthday, and uh, some of the former members there came because uh, they liked my mom, and they liked us too, so it wasn't a big deal. And we finished, and we're standing around talking. He said, you know, uh, people are getting kind of tired with the new pre uh, the preacher we have now because he keeps blaming everything on you. Ten years later, <laughs> and I'm thinking, "Yay! What am I doing? You know, I'm not. I'm getting beat up, and I don't even know it. You know, uh, so you know that's you, you, we can keep bringing up the past and things that are happening in the past, but that doesn't do anybody any good either. You know, uh, we want to. Uh, you know, if we need to be forgiving and to some extent, we can say forgetful. To other extents, especially if emotions are involved, that's not the easiest thing to do either. You can't forget things like, again, Corey Ten Broom or Simon Wiesenthal and the, and the Holocaust. You can't, those are things you can't forget, but at least you can work with them and uh, not let it burden you down or burden us down. Uh, you know, a preacher said the word the wrong way or said something I didn't like, or, well, 10 years ago he said, and, you know, that's just not going to work. Uh, last week, David talked about the uh, fig tree that was cursed and then the temple, and he, didn't get, he mentioned uh, the, uh, a little bit of, uh, in verse 5 of Mark 12, uh, Mark 13. Uh, I'm sorry, wrong place. Mark 11, verse uh, 25. So he mentioned uh, about having faith in God and the mountain being cast into the sea. But the last verse says, and when you stand praying, if any, you, ho you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that the Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. So we do have a responsibility to be, to be a forgiving people. And Jesus has an interesting thing in Matthew 5. You go to the temple, and there you remember somebody has sinned against you. Leave your gift at the temple, at the altar, and go. Now, that was a Jewish context. What would we do in a Christian context? If you're in the assembly and you see somebody that either you've offended or has offended you, do well, I'm not going to have anything to do with them. I don't have you know. Or, you know, will we be willing? And they may not realize it. Uh, they may not, or they may say, man, I don't remember it. Uh, when you ask, say, you know, you kind of offended. Well, I'm sorry, you know, I don't remember. And you have to be willing to accept. <laughs> you may not get an answer you like <laughs> yeah. for different reasons. But still, we need to say, I'm willing to forgive them when I, I forgive them. And you know, that's where we sometimes may have to end it. Jesus on the cross said, talked about forgiveness twice. The first time he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. There was a big crowd out there, uh, Jews and Gentiles. He, wasn't, he didn't make any forgive certain people. He said, forgive them. Now, it's interesting. <laughs> What does that say? Is that just a, oh, we need seven statements from Jesus on the cross, so here's the first one? Or did he really mean, Father, forgive them? And by saying that, were they forgiven? Now, you know, they had to face some of those consequences over in Acts 2. You, you, by the hands of lawless men, to crucify and slay. Uh, so, but still, did Jesus mean what he said when he said, Father, forgive them? And, of course, we are more familiar with the thief on the cross. Uh, Today you'll be with me in paradise. So he was uh, a roundabout way of saying, 
uh, Jesus, remember you when you come in your kingdom, today you'll be with me in paradise. Oh, you're forgiven. You know, then they don't mention it, but that's the idea that's being expressed there. Um, I often think about how these pictures affect me and what I'm doing or have done. And I realize that forgiveness starts usually with open consultation, maybe just you, know, you and that person who offended you. But I, I remind myself constantly, and, and sometimes others too, that um, if you have an offense or you concern about something, you're supposed to look at the person and talk about it. But many of us don't have the courage to do that, but we all of a sudden get the courage to talk about the person to other people. You know, and, and I try to yeah. make, make myself do this right, go one-on-one -on -one and, and discuss whatever it is at that time. And when it comes to forgiveness again, um, I found that um, when I'm carrying around unforgiveness or something, I see a difference in my relationship with God. And when I clear my clear these things up, the difference is obvious that God is able to do more things with me now that I have forgiven whatever, whatever, than he was able to do before with me when I was carrying around mm -hmm. this unforgiveness. And so those kinds of things, you know, usually shock me, but it's always a good shock. Yeah. It helps me to get back on track. Right, you get the burden off and mm -hmm. uh, we stop eating ourselves up with it. It's tempting to run to Marty and say, Marty, you need to deal with this situation because I didn't like what he said. <laughs> then, <laughs> Representing the elders. <laughs> Rather than go, going to the person directly and saying, you know, you deal with it. I don't want to deal with it uh, because I don't want to uh, get involved. <laughs> sure. You're the one offended. You're involved. <laughs> you know, so come on. You know, think about it. Think, go through it. You know. Interesting way we can we can talk about how people perceive us and how we perceive others. I talked to uh, uh, it was at Eisenhower High School. The picture lady was my temple. Uh, with uh, and, and we we would always hear people say, "Oh, you teach at Eisenhower. Oh, rough school." And most of the people who said that were from Westfield because that's where our children went. <laughs> and I would say, you know, that's that's what everybody at Eisenhower says about Westfield. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep, yep. And I, I taught there for 22 years. I, I, I'm not going to tell you I never broke up a fight because I did. <laughs> but I, I was, I was, I was never, yeah. you know, it's just a pleasant experience. But, but we perceive things, sometimes based on what we hear. So. Yeah, and people, you know, it's not like people don't ever misunderstand anything anyone says. Uh, and I, I've mentioned this before, but I was teaching a class, and it was somehow I said, we don't know when the Lord's going to return. It may be this afternoon. It may be in a thousand years. And a hand went up like that, you know. I mean, oh, wow. There, and, oh, do you believe in the thousand-year reign? Where did that come from? <laughs> we weren't talking about... Uh, you know, anything near that. It was just uh, using it as an illustration when the Lord may come back. And a thousand is easier to say than 10,000 or a million or something like that. So, uh, but it's it, it, how we're, we're thinking about things and we're reading things and we're going through it in our mind. And it's difficult sometimes to look at another person's perspective and, uh, and to see that. And so we either misunderstand because we hear something based on our experiences and our understandings, that isn't really what it is. That's why we need to clarify things, uh, define our, our definitions. What does this mean? What does that mean? Uh, reading these articles on the Holocaust, uh, there are different ways people look at and set, kind of expand it out to uh, different events. And there's a lot of questions as to uh, how you're defining then the Holocaust. Is it uh, multiple times that has happened throughout history, or is it just one uh, exclusive time? And for the Jewish people, it uh, narrows down because it was a deliberate uh, intention to wipe out the entire uh, Jewish culture and race and everything, whereas the others had other... There's some, uh, some debate, in, or there's a lot of debate, again, uh, maybe on the Armenian situation uh, with the Turks, uh, the Turkish uh, people, so there's, there's a, that's probably one of the closest. But they looked at a whole bunch of different things, and it's really, uh, you know, yeah. 
you know, it's not easy to define. <laughs> they're, they're just by how you look at it and your perspective of things. So anyway, forgiveness is, again, a, a tough subject, not so much in, in saying it as in practicing it. And so uh, Marty pointed out last week, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 13, uh, afterwards, he told me, couldn't tell me in class, of course, <laughs> uh, 4 through 8, you know, the subject of love, which really fits into most of this definition. And the couple that did the Lord's Supper last week, too, got my attention when they mentioned the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. And you read through the fruit of the Spirit, and again, you're seeing a lot of this. So there's those ideas that this is something emphasized God is, who God is and who we should be because he's providing us with ways to accomplish this. It's not just simply leaving us on our own to do what we want. Uh, and put it into practice. So th the difficulty then is how do we become compassionate? How do we show love? How, do we, how are we slow to anger? Uh, you know, there's a lot of anger out there today, uh, and we need to be careful. You know, it's easy to... Uh, th there's anger if you want it, want it to see it, if you're looking for it. But for the most part, most people don't care. They just want to, let's just talk, let's be friends, let's... you know and. So, you know, I have neighbors and we, uh, nice young couple next to us, couple of kids, you know, nice to talk to. Uh, some of my other neighbors have changed over the years, so they're not, uh, we wave <laughs> sometimes. If you see, we're old, we stay in the house. <laughs> but, uh, but our neighbors will help us when we need it, so uh, there's that type of thing. Uh, all these are, e are easy to say. God practiced them all. Uh, he, Israel slowed to anger for 800 years of history before he carried into captivity. Uh, the graciousness of God is seen all over the place, forgiveness. So any, any comments anybody like to make? Wow. <laughs> the time change finally caught up with everybody. <laughs> is that what? Is that what's happened here? Uh, okay, well, I mentioned Marty's things. So uh, we, we look at God again defining himself. It encompasses his identity, his character, his honor, and the purposes of God. We are then image bearers. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, we are created in God's image. Now, it's not a physical thing. Uh, and again, people debate exactly what that all means, but it's the character that we have as people, and we're made in his image, and we become these image bearers, and so rather, that's why we don't have idols in Judaism or Christianity, because we are basically, in a positive sense, the idols. We're the image of God. People should see God in us. Uh, other uh, forms of idolatry, they, you know, they create the god, the cow, the whoever it may be, the per, uh, being with eight arms and seven heads and whatever, whatever they put together. And they say, well, that's our god. That's what our god looks like, uh, the image of our... Well, that's why God was angry back again where this all started with the cow. Why would you make a golden calf? and say, well, here are your gods. First thing he said, plural, not singular. So here are your gods. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> That's not who led you out of Egypt. One God. Uh, he defeated, he told you he defeated the gods of Egypt. Uh, and then uh, why are you making it in the form of a cow? That's the only thing they were familiar with in the area, whether it was the Canaanites or the Egyptians. That was a popular, popular god. So they made it in something they were familiar with. And God is angry with them because that's not who he is. I'm not a, an idol made of stone and, and uh, has to be rolled around. Isaiah 44, Isaiah 40 to 55 is uh, a, a very, good, very good text. I enjoy that. And there's some in there. Isaiah 44 in particular is uh, rather sarcastic, shall we say, of God as he tells 
you, you, you cut down a tree, uh, you chop up the wood and you make a fire, and then you carve up the other part of the wood and you make an idol and you say, thank you for saving me. <laughs> and then you have to get a cart and put the idol on there and haul it around. Uh, and you know, it's all in sarcasm. Uh, and it, it, need, it can't see, it can't hear, it can't speak to you. It has to be, you have to move it around. Well, what kind of God is that? Or you think about the Elijah and the prophets of Baal. You know, uh, you go first, uh, call on Baal to take care of this offering here. And, of course, Elijah, likewise, <laughs> uh, sarcastically mocks them. Oh, maybe he's on a journey. Shout louder. Uh, maybe he's asleep. Wake him up. Uh, you know, and, and you can just, um, I mean, you, you think of the scene. It gets kind of funny. And then Elijah just comes along and tells people to do the, you know, water and every, and then a fire comes out, you know, and whose God is God? Or even going back to Gideon, uh, you know, the, uh, the, fleece? Uh, no, not the fleece, the, uh, Gideon knocks down the, uh, the idol that's in, uh, where, where, whichever group he's fighting, and it breaks, uh, it falls down the first night, and they put it back up, and the next day, it's, they find it, the head, head's gone, the arms are broken, the legs are broken, and they're all upset with Gideon, and Gideon's dad says, look, if, if he's a god, let him fight his own battle. <laughs> uh, don't think so, but you know, so it's, uh, that's how we, people may look at it. We are God's image bearers, and so these are the things that we should be showing people. And we're not going to be God because he's the creator, he's beyond us. And we, we, to see his glory is, uh, even in part, you'll, you know, Moses' face shone and all that. Uh, and the, the transfiguration was a similar thing. But this is how we're to be as image bearers. And so we should be practicing these things uh, because that's part of who we are. Uh, and you notice, again, the forgiving, as forgiving aspects, wickedness, rebellion, sin. Oh, those are pretty bad things. In sin, obviously, is pretty general, but wickedness and rebellion, God was angry with that. And all you have to do is read Ezekiel or read Genesis, 6, uh, Genesis 18 with Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, rebellion, just pick any of the history, history uh, books and see how God's, God's all that. So these are very serious things in God's sight. One of, the, one of the things that we, we remember is that you know, we're made in the image of God, and God is love. And so we, we look at our children and, and, and we say to them, um, there's, there's nothing you can ever do to cause me to stop loving you. I might be a little upset. I might even go ballistic on you. But, but there's nothing I'll ever, or she'll ever do yeah. that will cause me to stop loving you. We get that directly from God. And, that's how we we truly understand mm -hmm. how God feels about us. Mm -hmm. He can be upset with us, even ballistic, but he still loves us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you see that. Uh, Hosea 11, uh, I, uh, he talks about bringing his son out of Egypt. But you read through the rest of the chapter, and God is trying to get these people back into where they, they're walking with him. Because that's what God wants. He wants to be in a relationship. And again, when we talk about forgiveness, it's difficult how God, God will forgive us with no problem. We have problems forgiving us, ourselves. And so we may you know, want to back away or we may, well, I, I don't know if I can really you know, be that involved because God is still angry with me or mad at me, and we we look at it, and sometimes we practice that too. If a, uh, it's one thing for a person to repent uh, and then say, oh, I'm just going to jump in where I left off. Some people don't want to do that, and some people don't want people to do that. And yet there is a need to realize you're accepted back in because you're forgiven. And so you may have much more to say because of that, re that broken relationship that's now mending to us 
than someone who's been around for 50 years and never did anything, quote, <laughs> uh, bad or uh, wrong or something like that. Uh, again, that's in quotes. <laughs> No, you. Years ago, before I even married, I, I worshipped at uh, Six Things in Fire Church back in Abilene as part of the blessed ministry. And we had a man who, who visited frequently. And I, I, I know I've told this story to some of you. Everything I say, I've told before. But anyway, <laughs> but, but he, he, he would arrive in, on Sunday morning worship right after we began. And he'd usually sit in the back seat. In a church class, that's hard to do, but anyway, he would, he would sit in the back, and uh, during the last song, he'd get up and walk out. We could never meet him, and a couple of the elders stationed themselves back there in the foyer to meet this guy. And they shook hands with him, introduced themselves, asked him if he would like to place membership or perhaps baptism, and his response to them was, and this is a quote, you don't understand. God can't forgive my sin. And I thought, Wow, what a number Satan did on this guy. Yeah. And he just turned around and walked out. We never saw him again. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm thinking, he forgave his crucifixion. If he can forgive that sin, your sin is nothing but a speck of dust on the floor compared to that sin. And if he can forgive that sin, I mean, yours is easily forgivable. But, uh, yeah, Satan has just done a number on him. Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult to sometimes understand what God's thinking. <laughs> but when he says, I want all people to be saved, well, you think about all the people that you, we see in, this, in history and the horrible things they've done. Yeah. I was watching a movie that's based on a true story called, with Gregory Peck. He's playing a priest in, in the Vatican in Rome during World War II. And uh, uh, he is in contact with the German uh, officer in control of, uh, of, Berlin, of Berlin, of Rome. And, uh, of course, he knows some of the horrible things that the Germans did, uh, even there. And uh, he is involved in getting uh, people out of, uh, out of uh, Rome and the Vatican to safety in, in Spain and Switzerland and so forth. And so as the movie progressed, uh, they have built a somewhat tense relationship, and near the end of the movie, he asks the uh, the German officer, "Things are falling apart. They know they had to get out of there." That if he would get his family uh, out of uh, out of Rome, and Peck says, "No," uh, he said, "All the horrible things you've done, and you want us to, you know." And they go on this long speech, and he wa Peck walks away, and. The German officer just yells out something about what, and you talk about being a man of God, and for you know, and so uh, after the war, uh, this officer he's found guilty, he's in prison, and uh, and then more of the story later on, and you have to kind of research him a little bit more, but he's in prison uh, and he's being questioned, and uh, he's told that his family is in Switzerland. How did he get, how did they get there? Who did you tell? And he just, he said, I don't know. In his, that was his response, but he, he just sat there in shock that the, the priest actually did it. <laughs> Gregory Peck's character got his family out of Rome, even though they had this strong dialogue where neither of them would uh, give in any way, one way or the other. Later on, he is baptized into the Catholic Church, and uh, he, he is visited throughout his uh, imprisonment. He is visited by this priest at least once a month. So they had a relationship. But, you know, let's, we, we think, how can somebody even think about forgiving such a person? You know, and, and we have a hard time forgiving our spouse because they burned the food or... <laughs> Left the cap off the toothpaste or put socks on the floor. <laughs> I know I'm exaggerating that a little bit. <laughs> so, and we, so, you know, we have to, 
we have to kind of put things in perspective sometimes as where we, we think these things are going. As, we, we think sometimes it's easy, you know, again, it's easy to talk about this stuff, but putting it into practice is really, really hard. Uh, and we can make fun of, or at least make humor out of some of this, but uh, it's difficult. One of the best lessons I learned was uh, we said that we were in a college devotional and uh, we were, before the, we started, we were kind of joking about uh, a government official uh, because it was funny. <laughs> but the next Sunday morning after service, uh, a college girl came to me and said, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. And she said, I was offended by the things that were being said about this fellow. Not that she would support this fellow, but that she was offended. And so we ended up talking about an hour in my office, just uh, uh, discussing different things. But I did apologize to her. And it, I thought when she first started, well, I can come up with 100 reasons. Just like that, boom, 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 boom. You know? But that's not going to solve anything. And so I just said, I'm sorry. I, it wasn't my purpose to offend anybody. I didn't mean to. And we had a good conversation. And we're pretty good friends after that, you know, so it helped in a, in a relationship there. Uh, same congregation, other things happened that were not that way. So people didn't come talk to you. Uh, they went to the elders or they, uh, you know, so it's really strange sometimes how. You know, one of the big things with why forgiveness is such a touchy subject and so confusing is it's two is different kinds of forgiveness. Okay. And 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 the foundation of our whole being as as children of God comes through forgiveness. But like you just mentioned earlier, they say, well only God can forgive. Well that's true. Yeah. You know, oh, God has forgiven. It's not as a result of having forgiven us, we stand in a state of continuing from that blessing. Right. But but the the problem is we Jesus took the things that were sinful that made us that that made us sin and say, okay, that's sin, that's sin, that's sin. He took that and nailed it to the cross. So for me to hold a sin against you, I have to hold it against me too. It's no other way. I have to take that sin off the cross and say this mm -hmm. applies to you. Why I'm doing that it applies to me. And that's the real scary thing when I hear yeah. people talk yeah. and say, I hope you burn in hell because you <laughs> killed my family. Man. I understand the emotions out of that, but that is very yeah. dangerous yeah. because you're telling God, this man should burn in hell for sin. Yeah. And, and, and a sin that you well, make you disrespect the cross and even think in that way. Right. So the way we view things and the way we think, that's what needs to be fixed, not our actions. We we're kind of quick to point people, do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that. Instead of, wait, what did you, what do you believe? Why yeah. do you believe yeah. that? Where did you get that from? Like you, like God said, who told you you were naked? God knew why they were naked, but, but who told you? Where did you yeah. get that information? We got to constantly keep that focus. Where did we get right. that from? But the, you mentioned something like keeping the, getting the cap off the two places and all that. I mean, that's funny, but... Those things exist. Yeah. They be putting out the trash. <laughs> Listen to me. I've done this seminar. Every seminar is where putting up. Okay, everybody get out of the way now. <laughs> you know, but eight couples said that was one of the biggest things in the event. I'm like, and we were looking at each other like, okay, we were. We felt some of those, but the trash. <laughs> but that's yeah. the thing. That forgiveness calls for compassion. Now, yeah. You, you, and so most of the problems in our lives in, in unforgiveness is the compassion. Right. It's not about actual sin. It's about things I don't like that you do. Or whether you do it to me or somebody else. You know, people will be saying, well, they shouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have done it that way. And I say, okay, well, who are you? You know, I, I, I actually say that to So, because I want people to think, I don't care. Them being mad at me is not the issue. Because if they get mad at me, that might make them think more. My thing is just plant the seed and keep moving because people, we are, we are 
tearing each other up mm -hmm. because of lack of compassion. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's right. That's what, what we struggle Which, with the most as a, as a people. Yeah. Right. You know? He starts with compassion and ends yeah. with forgiveness. So. And those, those uh, are grievances, so it's quite different. You make me think about people do things intentionally to us, and he mentioned about if your child gets murdered, that's quite different. That takes, that's a whole, that's, that's yeah. a whole process. Yeah. Um, to give you a personal, my aunt was telling a story about her son, my cousin I killed years ago, and they did a story about her, and she was talking about how she forgive, and that took years to get to that point. It wasn't automatic. You know, it wasn't automatic, and she was telling a story, and they were asking about that, uh, that she had to forgive the kid, that, you know, the, uh, that her son killed my cousin. That was over 30 years ago. Yeah. And it's still there. Yeah. And she talks yeah. about it. You know, you got, she still talks about what happened, and it's to her, but she has to get it, so it's continuing. Right. It's not a one-time thing. He's talking about, you know, we deal with things that are, like, offensive. Mm -hmm. It's quite different if somebody intentionally does something to you. Yeah. You think about the Holocaust or people intentionally. That's quite different. You know, you don't take out the trash. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> or you load the dishwasher a certain way. <laughs> well, brother, so, so we'll so not talk know. about that. Today <laughs> 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 in our church, the things we, you know, you know, talking about forgiveness, right. you know, it's really just somebody, I don't right. like what they said. That's quite different than, you know, so intentional, yeah. but we hold those grudges and then it becomes, oh, there, uh, yeah. it becomes a grudge. Yeah, we yeah. hold the grudges and, yeah. and, yeah. and, and the other thing is, going back, uh, that, uh, Jesus said, uh, judge not that you be not judged, because well, what judgment or standard you use will be, so your point was excellent that, you know, if <laughs> taking the sin down from the cross, yeah. that's, I'm going to be judged by that, you know, so I, do we want to be judged by compassion and love, or do we want to be judged by, uh, you know, yeah. I'm going to send, you ought to be burning in hell, well, <laughs> you looking forward to fire? You know, type of thing. So, you know, fire burns and all that. George, I was thinking of what they said about uh, the toothpaste and all this stuff. <coughs> as, it, as it relates to, to couples and in the church as well, uh, Paul told those Galatians in Galatians 5 that uh, be careful because if you 